welcome. I wanted to thank the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, uh, the School of Social and Political Sciences, and uh, an unusual trilogy, the School of Culture and Communication. And I'm very glad to be back uh, in the place to be, um, Victoria, where I happily spent uh, two years uh, of my life when uh, I had my very first uh, teaching job uh, in Australia before leaving for 100 years and, and coming back. Um, thank you very much uh, for the welcome and um, thank you ladies and gentlemen for coming. I want tonight to discuss a revolution. Uh, in the beginning, you may know, there was the world's first ever simultaneous satellite television broadcast featuring live Maria Callas, Pablo Picasso, the Beatles, and the Melbourne Hannah Street tram station. <laughs> then came fax machines, photocopiers, video recorders, and personal computers. Now there is cloud computing, electronic books, scanners, interactive video technology, smartphones converted into satellite navigators and musical instruments, even speak to tweets used in Tunisia and Egypt in the recent uh, uprisings. It's unclear, as you know, even to the innovators what comes next, but these and other media inventions, commercially available only during recent uh, decades, have persuaded more than a few people that we are living in a revolutionary age of communicative abundance. In the spirit of this revolution, as in every previous revolution in the prevailing mode of communication, fascination mixed with excitement is fueling much bold talk, for example, of the transcendence of television, the disappearance of printed newspapers, the decline of the book, even the end of literacy as we know it. There's widespread recognition, correctly in my view, that time is up for spectrum scarcity, for mass broadcasting, and predictable prime-time national uh, audiences. Symbolized by the internet, uh, here is one of many uh, beautiful uh, images, um, crystalline images that you can find on the internet. Um, symbolized by the internet, the age of communicative abundance is a new world system of overlapping and interlinked media devices. This is my definition, by the way, of communicative abundance, so you, you have to follow carefully. It's a long sentence. So a new world system of overlapping and interlinked media devices that for the first time in history, thanks to built-in cheap microprocessors, integrate texts, sounds, and images in compact and reproducible form, so enabling communication to take place through multiple user points in chosen time within modularized and ultimately global networks that are affordable and accessible to more than a, a billion people scattered across the globe. The consequence, as you know from your own lives, is that many people routinely sense sideways motion and forward movement in the way they communicate even in the little things of life. Gone are the days, here's an image by the way, from the uh, Museum for Communication in Berlin uh, that some of you may remember from your childhoods. Um, gone are the days when children played with jam tin tins connected by string as telephones. Everybody chuckles today when mention is made of the wireless. Typewriters belong in curiosity shops. Even the couch potato seems to be a, distant, uh, uh, a figure from the distant past. Few people think twice about the transformation of words like text, Skype, and Google into verbs. And think of what is happening to news. Savvy young people in countries such as South Korea and Japan are no longer wedded to traditional news outlets. They do not listen to radio bulletins or watch current affairs or news on television. These digital natives uh, refuse the old habit of mining the morning newspaper for their up-to-date information as four out of every five American citizens once did in the early 1960s. Internet portals have become their favorite uh, des destination for news. It's not that they're uninterested in news, it's rather that they want lots of it news on demand in instant form and delivered in new ways, not merely in the mornings but throughout the day and night. Not surprisingly, plenty of observers, even from the, the newspaper industry itself, have warned of the coming disappearance of newspapers. 
The claims are sometimes deliberately outlandish, designed to shock, for instance, through observations, uh, for instance in Australia, that the proportion of adults who read a daily newspaper has declined in 1980 from 32% to today, 2010, to merely 16%. And some draw from this uh, extrapolations that newspapers in countries such as the United States will no longer be printed um, after 2020, uh, 30, or 40. Now, as in every previous communication revolution, think of the upheavals triggered, for instance, by the introduction of the printing press, telegraph, radio, television. The age of communicative abundance is an age of uncertainty. It breeds exaggerations, it breeds false hopes, it breeds illusions. But there can be no doubt, in my view, when judged in terms of speed and scope, ease of reproduction and complexity, that the new galaxy of communicative in, uh, abundance has no historical precedent. Time-space compression has become a reality. Cheap and reliable cross-border communication is the norm for growing numbers of people and organizations. The tyranny of distance and slow time connections is abolished. And that's why a curse is uttered when we lose or misplace our mobile phones or when our internet connections are down. We feel lost. The distributed networks of uh, uh, communicative abundance are very striking. Here is a, um, an image which we could talk about at some length but put very simply, um, an historical shift has been taking place from Model A, centralized uh, distributed networks of the ABC, BBC model, towards C. Uh, so that in contrast, say, to um, centralized state-run broadcasting systems of the past, the spider's uh, web linkages among many different modes within a distributed network make them intrinsically more resistant to centralized uh, control. Um, on, on the net you will find many uh, images of this kind to give you visually a sense of this uh, networked distributed uh, quality of communications as they are emerging in our times. Networks, as you know, function according to the logic of packet switching. Information flows or acts of communication pass through many points en route to their destination. If they meet resistance at any point within the system of nodes, then the information flows are diverted automatically, rerouted in the direction of their intended destination. Messages go viral. It's this networked character of media-saturated societies that makes them prone to dissonance and to resistance uh, to power. Um, among the uh, leading analysts of this trend is Clay Shirky, an American uh, professor who you may know has uh, argued that the age of communicative abundance is an age where, and I'm quoting, group action just got easier because, thanks to networked communications and easy to use tools, the expressive capability, as he puts it, of citizens, their capacity for self-reduction, uh, John Hartley, an Australian scholar's uh, uh, phrase, is raised to unprecedented uh, levels. One last opening observation about this revolution that is going on, this emergent age of communicative abundance, as uh, I'm describing it, is that contrary to earlier predictions, the new digital media show no signs of cannibalizing old media, such as television and radio and books. In fact, the overall quantity of mediated communication grows, along with um, ever more complex and hybrid patterns of usage. For example, America. America's love affair with television continues unabashed, but in altered, more multimedia form. The average number of televisions in 2010 per US household is 2.5. Nearly a third of households have four or more televisions. I haven't a clue where they all go. But in the last quarter of 2009, according to the most recent um, uh, data that we have, simultaneous use of the internet while watching television reached three and a half hours a month, up 35% from the previous year. Nearly 60% of Americans now use the internet while watching TV. Internet video watching is rising fast, and so is the preference for watching videos on smartphones. 
It's interesting, I think, that the Asia-Pacific region in which we're located is arguably the laboratory of future patterns of multimedia usage. Japan, for instance, whose citizens on average watch television four hours a day, is the country with the most avid bloggers globally, posting more than a million blogs per month. Each of its well-entrenched social networking sites and game portals, Mixi, Gree, Mobage Town, has over 20 million registered users. Everywhere in this region, the take-up rate of new media is striking. Microblogging, for example, uh, the use of Twitter in India and social networking is all the rage. Meanwhile, Australians uh, 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 produce uh, and reproduce mateship in new digital form by spending, you may know, more time on social media sites, nearly seven hours per month, than any other country in the world. And then there are the rapid, uh, rapidly thickening uh, uh, cross-border connections displayed, this is the most recent image um, done by um, a young researcher published um, in the LA Times of Facebook use. Uh, this is December 2010. Three quarters of the world's internet population now has visited Facebook, Wikipedia, YouTube, or some other social uh, network or blogging uh, site. Now, pushed here and there by these uh, various trends, it's unsurprising, I want to suggest to you, that the developing culture of communicative abundance stokes political visions. The printing press, you know, spawned fantasies of liberty of the press, uh, a phrase which first appears uh, during the 17th century. The telegraph created visions of a world without war. They flourished towards the end of the 19th century. Communicative abundance, um, analogously, fuels much excited talk. For instance, if you look at James Gleick's recent book called The Information, a whole theory um, of a transformation that's going on in terms of information as the fundamental resource of contemporary societies. I think it's overblown, but it's what you would expect of this kind of uh, 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 radical transformation that I'm trying to describe to you. There is, meanwhile, much talk of digital democracy, of online publics, of cyber citizens, and wiki government. Even uh, uh, loose talk, very loose talk, Tim Berners-Lee uh, has uh, said something like this in, in recent months, um, of the way in which uh, this communications revolution is feeding somehow automatically uh, democracy. And one uh, statement of this um, is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's uh, well-known speech um, about a year ago at Washington, at the opening of Washington's uh, museum, in which he uh, basically said that the internet is going to level uh, power relations, and the United States stands for this leveling, so that all of humanity, and I am quoting, has equal access to knowledge and power. So, according to this view, communicative abundance and what is typically described as liberal representative democracy are seen somehow as conjoined twins. The stunning process and product innovations in the communications infrastructure are driving, so it's argued, the dispersal and public accountability of power. What I want to do uh, in the remainder of this lecture is to drill down into these, I think, wild um, vague uh, and certainly um, unsubstantiated uh, claims in some measure. I want to drill down into these claims. I want to scrutinize their veracity. I want to look um, to probe more carefully, as Marshall McLuhan uh, himself uh, tried to do, at the revolutionary things that are happening inside this swirling galaxy of communicative abundance. I don't think a complete picture in self-defense in advance is possible. Um, and it's simply because the complexity of what is going on is too complex, too elusive, to be captured in smooth and slick formulae, in statistics, in hard and fast rules, in confident predictions. We could say, metaphorically, that communicative abundance is a harsh mistress. She keeps her secrets. We live in a strange new world of confusing unknowns, a thoroughly mediated universe cluttered with tools of communication whose political effects have the capacity to hypnotize and to overwhelm us. And so here is my opening uh, and key conjecture. What we uh, need uh, in these times are bold new probes, fresh perspectives, 
wild new concepts, as Umberto uh, Eco uh, would say, that enable different ways of seeing things, something like a gestalt switch uh, that enables more discriminating methods of recognizing the novelties of our times and the democratic opportunities they offer and the counter trends that have the potential to snuff out uh, these uh, democratic trends. Minimally, I think this means uh, questioning and giving up all descriptions of communication media um, uh, using uh, zombie uh, categories, uh, categories that are exhausted, living dead categories like the fourth estate, uh, which one still hears journalists um, using. That's a misleading metaphor, in fact, um, originating with Edmund Burke and the French Revolution. It's wildly, as a descriptive term, inappropriate for the things that are going on. I think references, loose talk of the media, uh, similarly, uh, need uh, to be ditched. I think disciplinary divisions, for instance, between political science and uh, communications, uh, need to be bridged. Democracy and media need to be analyzed simultaneously and in new ways, throwing off um, old concepts and, and perspectives and inherited uh, categories from the era of radio and television. And one could say, to put it boldly, that just as in the 16th century, when the production of printed books and the efforts to read codex type required a fundamental shift of perspective, so today, in the emergent uh, era of communicative abundance, a whole new mental effort is required to make sense of how democracies are being shaped and reshaped by the new tools and rhetoric of communication, and why, perhaps, our very thinking about democracy must also change. But how to proceed? Which are the key trends that we need to note, to interpret, to internalize in our thinking about democracy in the age of Google, Facebook, and WikiLeaks? Well, in support of this uh, conjecture, um, in defense of fresh thinking, I see six, six, a good half dozen um, emergent trends that are pivotal. And I want um, very briefly to uh, summarize these in the remaining time, beginning uh, with um, the, this strange phrase um, of monetary democracy, not monetary democracy, monetary democracy. The gist of this um, is that, of this thesis is, that uh, after 1945 and in our times greatly nurtured by communicative abundance, there is a fundamental uh, redefinition in practice of uh, democracy going on. That's my party piece. Um, without going into any detail, if you look at the textbooks, you will find that democracy typically is spoken about, and politicians and others typically speak of democracy as a political form that happens within territorial states, and its central quality is that citizens um, vote for parties um, whose representatives uh, fill a parliament that forms a government um, that, um, that nurtures an executive uh, within a constitutional framework. And this all happens within a mediated context, uh, in the context of courts, uh, administrative structures, and so on. But the central quality of democracy is um, elections. And that is a view of democracy that, for instance, was championed all through the two uh, Bush administrations. Um, what I want to suggest uh, to you is, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, but certainly nurtured um, by the trends I began this lecture uh, describing, that a shift towards what I am calling monetary democracy is taking place in all actually existing democracies on the face of the earth. And to put it very, very simply, it's that democracy is coming to mean in practice and as a norm, fair, free, clean elections, nothing less but much more, so that democracy comes to mean the permanent public scrutiny uh, of power wherever it is exercised, not only in the field of government, but also, for example, in the field of uh, market economies, corporations, in the field of NGOs, and interestingly, uh, a practice of democracy, thanks to um, communicative abundance, that crosses borders for the first time, historically speaking. Uh, so that democracy, 
um, if you like, the, the promiscuous quality of democracy as a challenge to power is no longer contained within the territorial state. And I can't, unfortunately, uh, have time, but you can get uh, something of a picture just by looking at my little work of art. Um, you know, multiple monitors, some of which operate within territorial states, some across borders, um, uh, decreasingly controlled by parties and parliaments and governments, um, an era in which um, power is, is monitored by a whole series of watchdogs, guide dogs, barking dog institutions, um, judicially active courts, human rights networks, um, uh, protestables is a South Korean invention, civic initiatives, um, bioregional assemblies, bloggers, other web-based uh, monitors, these are all in the business of scrutinizing power and all of them have the effect of stirring up troubles and actually are contributing, or so I will suggest in a moment, to the unpopularity for the time being of parties and parliaments and politicians. It's little wonder that um, the public objections to unaccountable power uh, are associated with um, the emergence of permanent scandals. There seems to be no end of scandals, and there are even times when so-called gate scandals, like earthquakes, rumble beneath the, field, uh, the feet of whole governments. Um, I uh, uh, have said enough about this first trend, and I want now to talk about the other five trends that are observable, that seem to me to be nurturing this historical shift, this redefinition uh, from electoral state, territorial state bound uh, understandings of democracy to um, what I am calling monetary democracy. The second trend is uh, to do with the democratization of information. Thanks to cheap and easy methods of digital reproduction, we live in times of a sudden widening of access to published materials previously unavailable to publics or formerly available only to restricted circles of users. Democratization involves the dismantling of elite privileges in matters of information at the click of a mouse, often at zero cost. Growing numbers of people worldwide gain access from a distance to materials once available only on a restricted geographical basis or at a high cost. The New York Times online, you can still have 20 visits um, per month without paying. Harvard University's vast collection of Ukrainian language materials. And piratebay.org, a Swedish website that hosts uh, torrent files on which I'm sure some of you um, have been present. It's illegal, of course, but um, we won't go into that. All stand as symbols of this meaning of democratization as the widening of the footprint of information, of the availability of information of one kind or another to uh, larger audiences. But democratization of information, this second trend, also has another meaning, the process of drawing together, often for the first time, of new data sets that are made publicly available to users through entirely new pathways. Examples include Wikipedia, you may know that there are currently about 5.3 million entries and less than a third of entries on Wikipedia are in fact in English. It's a global phenomenon, but it's a database that never existed before. Um, or uh, one could look uh, at other examples. YouTube in 2010, users uploaded 35 um, hours of video per minute during the year 2010. A vast database of materials. Or one could give an example of the democratization of information, the new Computer History Museum, which is located in Mountain View in California. Visit it sometime. Or the European um, Library, uh, org, which has been formed in the last 18 months. It's a consortium of libraries from the nearly 50 member states of the Council of Europe to form a single search engine in 35 languages of all the books that exist. Um, in the uh, uh, European uh, area. Or one could take as a final example the Schlesinger Library's initiative in the United States called Capturing Women's Voices. It's a very uh, interesting and important idea. The idea is to collect, before they disappear, postings by women from a wide range of blogs and to preserve them for posterity. 
Now, the contemporary democratization of information, this second trend, invites uh, obvious comparisons with the Reformation in Europe, which was triggered in part by the conviction that access to printed copies of the Bible uh, could be widened, that they should be widened, that there were no spiritual or earthly reasons why reading its pages should be restricted to a select few who were proficient in Latin. Such comparisons may be overdrawn, but communicative abundance, or so I'm arguing, uh, undoubtedly opens gates and tears down fences separating producers and users of information so that new and vitally important information banks become accessible to many more users, often at great distances, more or less simultaneously at zero or low cost. Trend number three. The system of communicative abundance stirs up spirited controversies about the definition and ethical significance of the public-private division. Gone are the days, um, uh, theorized, for example, in the 19th century by John Stuart Mill, gone are the days when privacy could be regarded as a natural or as a given bedrock or substratum of some a priori taken for granted uh, experience. The Lebensfeld is what Husserl called it, and the young Jürgen Habermas wrote about um, the, the world of everyday life as untouched by macro structures. Habermas, by the way, you may know, has become in the last uh, 12 months a victim of a bogus tweeting exercise where a young Turkish student decided to tweet using the name of Jürgen Habermas um, and, you know, quoting long passages from, from Habermas. Habermas had to intervene to put an end uh, to that. Um, the point here is that what is private increasingly comes to be subject to um, publicly circulated opinion and information. Cheap and user-friendly methods of reproduction, access to network tools, ensure that we leave, live in the age of hyper-coverage, as, uh, for example, uh, Monsieur Strauss-Kahn has just uh, discovered uh, in New York. The world of the private can suddenly be made public. Unmediated privacy, the hiding away of power relations in private, has or is becoming a thing of the past. Thanks to such genres as Twitter, TV talk shows, talkback radio, there's an endless pr procession of ordinary people, so-called, talking publicly about what privately turns them on or off. We live in times in which millions of people act as if they are celebrities by displaying details of their intimate selves on Facebook. And we also live in times, for example, uh, in Germany, uh, there has been a major media scandal where um, a priest, a former priest who was abused um, uh, in his early years by another uh, priest within the Roman Catholic Church, suddenly discovered uh, online the priest who had abused him um, the Süddeutsche Zeitung took this up, and all hell broke loose within the German Catholic Church. Of course, um, there are backlashes. Some accuse um, high-pressure media coverage of killer instincts. That was um, the phrase and the theme of a very uh, famous book by Janet Malcolm called The Journalist and the Murderer. And you know it was a subtext of um, all the discussions and outpourings of the death of Princess Diana. There are legal challenges to invasive junk mail. There are calls for the paparazzi to back off, to exercise moral self-restraint. There are attempts to bring cases before the courts um, in defense of the right of privacy. Uh, Max Mosley, you may know, has just um, uh, lost a case in the European Court of Human Rights um, concerning a news of the world uh, piece. Uh, it caused great discussion in the British context and globally. Um, after the News of the World uh, said that he'd engaged in, quote, a sick Nazi orgy with five hookers. Um, he denied that. Um, it's a fascinating story, but the point is here, it's an example of a backlash against this um, denaturing, uh, this politicization of, of the private. Now, all these developments um, in matters of, of privacy suggest, I think, that communicative abundance exposes the, the contingency of the public-private division. It can no longer be seen, philosophically speaking, as a first principle. Uh, it is coming, instead, to be seen uh, more flexibly. That is to say, individuals and groups uh, within civil society and elsewhere come to think of it contextually, uh, more contingently. That is to say, they see that some things uh, should be kept private. 
But when confronted, for example, with mendacious politicians or men who are duplicitous about their sexual preference or leaders, as in Italy, desperate to confirm that they are really men, Berlusconi, they also learn that privacy can be a refuge for scoundrels so that embarrassing publicity given to private actions outing, the Americans first called it, is entirely justified. Fourth trend. The fourth trend is, has to do with um, what I uh, think is a new form of muckraking. Muckraking is a wonderful American neologism from the last uh, quarter of the 19th century associated with um, brave journalists like Nellie Bly and other reporters who fought for the cause of publicly exposing corruption and uh, injustice. The new muckrakers of our time, using the forces of communicative abundance, put their finger on a perennial problem for which monetary democracy is a solution. The problem is this. The power of elites always thrives on secrecy, silence, and invisibility. Gathering behind closed doors and deciding things in peace and private quiet is their specialty. So little wonder then that in the age of communicative abundance, to put things paradoxically, unexpected revelations become predictably commonplace. We could say, philosophically speaking, being is constantly ruptured by events, as Alain uh, Badieu uh, uh, would say. It's not just that stuff happens. Media users ensure that shit happens. Muckraking becomes rife. Sometimes it feels as if the whole world is run by rogues. There is little doubt in my mind that muckraking is a key reason why there is public disaffection with politicians, political parties, parliaments, and official politics in general. Consider a few cases from the 12-month media cycle 2008 and 2009. These are some of my uh, favorite bizarre examples. A male legislature, a legislator in the Florida State Assembly is spotted watching online porn while fellow legislators are debating the subject of abortion. During a fiercely fought presidential election campaign, one of the candidates, Barack Obama, switches to damage control mode, you may not know this, after calling a female journalist sweetie. He leaves her a voicemail apology. I am duly chastened. In Japan, a seasoned uh, politician, here he is, uh, Masatoshi uh, Wakabayashi, is caught with his finger on a button um, voting on behalf of a fellow member of the Diet who is not in the chamber. Uh, that's against the law and he was uh, forced uh, to resign. Or um, any of you th um, women thinking of going into politics um, uh, learn something from this case. Um, here is uh, Caroline Flint, uh, the former UK housing minister, who went to number 10 Downing Street clutching um, uh, notes for a meeting about house prices and of course, um, she unfortunately didn't put the notes in her handbag, which is what you must remember to do, because otherwise journalists will photograph that, blow it up, and um, what it showed is that what the minister subsequently said to the media was exactly the opposite of what is written in the documents. Um, <laughs> and um, such is uh, life under conditions of communicative abundance. I would say that my great-grandparents uh, would have found this whole process astonishing in its democratic intensity, especially when it comes um, to initiatives that lunge at the heart of secretive sovereign power. I'm in Melbourne, I have to mention WikiLeaks. It's by far the boldest and most controversial experiment, I think, in the public monitoring of secretive military power. You may know that pundits are saying that it's a, the novel defining story of our times, but in fact, if I am right, um, there is something that's not entirely novel about the WikiLeaks phenomenon because it's engaged, uh, of course, in a radical form of muckraking, but it takes full advantage of, uh, advantages, uh, advantage of all the trends that I've been describing. Low-cost digital reproduction, easy access multimedia integration organized through networks, capable of transforming vast quantities of data around the world virally, more or less instantly. You know that WikiLeaks has been posing as a lumpen outsider in the world of information. It's mastered the art of total anonymity through military-grade encryption, remailing software uh, it's known as. 
And for the first time on a global scale, WikiLeaks has created a viable custom-made social infrastructure for encouraging knowledgeable muckrakers within organizations to release classified data on a confidential basis, initially for storage in a camouflage cloud of servers, then to push that bulletproofed information into public circulation as an act of radical transparency uh, across multiple jurisdictions so that it functions, as Assange puts it, as an intellig intelligence agency of the people. WikiLeaks, it's worth pointing out, is guided by a theory of hypocrisy. It supposes that individuals are motivated to act as whistleblowers in organizations, not merely because their identities are protected by encryption, but above all because of the intolerable gaps between their organization's publicly professed aims and its private modus operandi. Hypocrisy, we could say, in the age of communicative abundance, is the night soil of muckrakers. Its rakes in the Augean stables of government and business have a double effect. They multiply the amount of muck circulated under our noses, whose own sense and our own sense of living in muck is consequently sharpened. Muckraking in the style of WikiLeaks has yet another source which helps explain why, even if it's shut down as a consequence of legal action, um, there will pl be plenty of uh, successes and some already have formed. There is now Balkan leaks, there is Euro leaks, and of course there is Domscheit's um, open uh, leaks. Put simply, WikiLeaks thrives, it feeds upon a contradiction. The contradiction is this. Large organizations such as, such as states and business corporations take advantage of the communications revolution of our time by going digital and staying digital. They do so to improve their internal efficiency and, ex and, and external effectiveness. And they do so by uh, handling very uh, uh, complex uh, 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 sums of data. But these vast streams of classified material which flow freely become easily leakable. And to the extent that there is a crackdown by organizations on leaks, the imposition of what um, Professor Assange, otherwise known as Mendax, calls a secrecy tax, to the extent that that happens, then the chances are that that organization will not be able to function effectively and efficiently. I think that's, that's the technical theory behind the political uh, thrust of, uh, of the WikiLeaks uh, phenomenon. Point number five. Um, I want to say something about unelected representatives because um, this uh, oxymoronic phrase is necessary, in my view, to make sense of another deep-seated trend that is um, associated closely with the uh, coming of communicative abundance. It's a phrase, of course, unelected representatives, which grates on democratic ears, so I want to say a few words about it. Who or what are unelected representatives? They are public figures who get lots of media attention, but they are not simply uh, celebrities. They are not just famous, and they are not just fame seekers, or what Marshall McLuhan once called million horsepower entities. Think of um, uh, the concert uh, held here in Melbourne, featuring um, Bono in the Make Poverty History uh, global campaign. A figure like him, whatever you think of him, is uh, an unelected representative, in my view. He and other unelected representatives stands for something outside and beyond their particular niche. This is their difference with celebrities. We could uh, take, uh, for instance, uh, here is uh, Wangari Muta uh, Matai, you may know um, is the first African woman to win a Nobel Prize and the founder of the Pan-African Grassroots Green Belt Movement. She subsequently moved into politics, into formal politics. What is interesting is that um, there are ever larger numbers of unelected representatives who were once in politics but now um, uh, uh, behave in this unelected representative form. Think of Mary Robinson, think of Jimmy Carter, think of Nelson Mandela, think of Al Gore. Um, elections and politics are not the normal destiny of unelected representatives. And what is interesting, in my view, is the way unelected representatives, thanks to communicative abundance, actually cast doubts on the integrity, the competence, the legitimacy of elected representatives. They are one of the sources of the unpopularity of formal politics uh, in many democracies uh, today. 
What is the basis of the legitimacy of these unelected representatives? In what sense are they representative? In what sense are they accountable to those who consider them representatives of something uh, bigger? Some of them are regarded as models of public virtue. Figures such as Martin Luther King, Princess Diana, or I should mention Han Han, um, China's uh, currently hottest uh, blogger. They're seen to be good or decent or wise or daring people who bring honesty, fairness, and other valuable things to the world. There are other unelected representatives um, whose basis of legitimacy is spiritual or religious commitments. Mother Teresa, Desmond Tutu uh, might be cases in point. Then there are uh, unelected representatives whose status is based on merit, on their achievements. Amitabh Bachchan, uh, India's screen star, who you may know uh, built an early reputation playing the role of a fighter against injustice, is a case in point. So too, um, uh, based on merit, might be Colombian-born Shakira Mubarak, or the Berlin Philharmonic. You may know that the Berlin Philharmonic um, is a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF. It stands for something great in the world. It stands for classical music, uh, integrity, openness uh, across borders, as well as uh, very fine music. Then there are figures, the Dalai Lama as instance, uh, where unelected representatives win um, affection and support because of their suffering, because of their courage, or their capacities for survival. And then finally, there's a whole clutch of unelected representatives whose legitimacy stems from what might be described as a moral monetary uh, con contract. That is to say, people subscribe um, to their organizations um, and can always withdraw that subscription if they don't like what um, the unelected representative does. But I have in mind here a body like Get Up in Australia or Amnesty International. Now, whatever you think of the particular reputations of the figures I've mentioned, it does seem to me that there is a qualitative jump um, in the density and the, the activity of unelected representatives because of this um, communications uh, shift that is taking place in our times. One of the effects of unelected representatives is to blow whistles or to point fingers or to urge governments and other bodies to improve the quality of their uh, performance. Unelected representatives point to policy failures. They point also to the general lack of political imagination of elected representatives. One of the um, important effects, in my view, of unelected representatives is that they serve as a reminder that representatives uh, uh, and leadership have been excessively politicized during the last half century. If you read political science texts about leadership, they typically are about uh, politicians and government and so on. When in fact, if you look at the genealogy of uh, words like leader in English and leaderess, they were first used not to describe um, uh, elected representatives, but they were used to describe people who led singing choirs or bands of dancers or musicians or religious congregations. Thanks to elected uh, representatives, uh, finally, I think that um, when they work well, when uh, they have effects on publics, they remind uh, citizens, they remind us all of something very elementary, that leaders only ever uh, receive their uh, legitimacy from people, that they're deeply dependent upon people known as the led, that true leaders, if you like, lead because they manage to get people to look up to them rather than hauling them by the nose. Finally, I want to say something um, about the development of cross-border publics. One of the um, long-term consequences, it seems to me, of communicative abundance is the way that um, it nurtures cross-border publics. The Canadian scholar, Harold Innes, uh, pictured here, showed, you may know, in a wonderful book, that communications media like the wheel and the printing press and the telegraph had distance-shrinking effects. But Innes did not know, he did not foresee, um, that genuinely globalized communication, 
which began during the 19th century with overland and underwater telegraphy and the early development of international news agencies like Reuters and so on, he did not foresee, could not have foreseen, that um, cross-border communications is actually go undergoing an evolutionary jump in our times. I'm aware that global media integration has its downsides for democracy. It has undoubtedly, I think, uh, deep and visceral feelings among millions of people. I estimate somewhere between 5% and 25% of the world's population who have uh, a sense that our worldly interdependence requires humans to share responsibility for our fate on Earth. But we should remember the cruel facts of communication poverty. A majority of the world's population, now uh, totaling nearly 7 billion, are too poor to buy a book. Less than half have ever made a phone call in their lives, and only around one quarter um, have access to the internet, whose distribution patterns, um, as you can see from this um, uh, map of the world, whose distribution patterns are highly uneven. Such fickle countertrends are sobering, but they don't form the whole story, or so I want to suggest to you. For in the age of communicative abundance, there are signs that the grip of parochialism upon citizens is not absolute, and that from roughly the time of the Vietnam War, there is an unintended political effect going on of the global integration of media, regardless of who owns it. By nurturing a world stage, a kind of theatrum mundi, one could say, communicative abundance has slowly but surely nurtured the growth of cross-border media events and with them a plurality of differently sized uh, publics. Mediated controversies about who gets what, when and how on a world scale. I think the events that are unfolding within the Arab world are uh, uh, obvious uh, recent cases in point. True, global publics are neither strongly institutionalized nor effectively linked to mechanisms of adequate representation and accountability. Global publics are voices, we could say, without a coherent body politic. It is as if they try to show the world that it resembles a chrysalis capable of hatching the butterfly of cross-border democracy, despite the fact that we, are currently, that we currently have no good account of what regional or global or cross-border democratic representation might mean in practice. But still, in spite of everything, global publics are beginning to have marked effects on uh, matters of power at the global, regional, and local levels. You could say that every great global issue since 1945, human rights, the dangers of nuclear war, continuing discrimination against women, the greening of politics, all of these have become issues that circulated globally because of the growth of these cross-border publics. You could also say that for the first time uh, in uh, modern uh, times, the language of global citizens um, is being uh, used ever more widely. Here is an image uh, you uh, may know from Barack Obama's um, Tiergarten uh, rally in July 2008, when he um, addressed, using this fictional uh, category of global citizens, he addressed global citizens in what he had to say. Of course, he was uh, addressing the American public and appealing for election, but the language, the discourse was uh, much wider uh, than this. This uh, is another uh, uh, instance. Or one could um, point, here is a, an old image of uh, Live Aid, um, the first ever groundbreaking media event, 1985. It attracted an estimated one billion viewers where um, something like a space of fun across borders uh, developed. Uh, but serious fun um, concerned with matters of common uh, public uh, interest to do with the suffering of distant strangers. One of the effects of global publics is to make possible what Hannah Arendt once called the politics of pity across borders. And you know that during especially dramatic moments, the nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl, the Tiananmen massacre, the 1989 revolutions in Central Eastern Europe, the overthrow and arrest of Slobodan Milosevic, the terrorist attacks on New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, massive earthquakes in Chile and China, the overthrow of dictators in Tunisia uh, and Egypt, the disasters at the four plants in Fukushima. You may know that publics, cross-border publics, where millions of people witness 
um, events and power conflicts that break out um, actually induce a certain sense of living contingently on a knife edge in the subjunctive tense. To put it differently, the witnesses of global media events in the age of communicative abundance do not enter a global village as Marshall McLuhan uh, uh, thought would happen, dressed in the skins of humankind and thinking in terms of, as he put it, a primor primordial village or tribal outlook. outlook. Audiences, in fact, don't experience uninterrupted togetherness. They come to feel a pinch of the world's power relations. They sense that our small world is an arena of struggle, the resultant of moves and counter moves, controversy and consent, compromise and resistance, peace and war. And in this way, they put matters like representation, accountability and legitim legitimacy on the political agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to stop. Um, the feedback has become too intense for me even to stand here. Um, my conjecture has been that the unfinished communications revolution of our time contains breathtaking dynamics that are not just without precedent, but are also having transformative effects on the spirit and the institutions and the meaning of democracy. My suggestion to you is that democracy can no longer be understood as it is still in many textbooks and among many government policy makers, as synonymous with periodic elections in territorial state form. My suggestion is that in our times, the fugitive power questioning spirit of democracy is manifested in fair and free elections and the ongoing public scrutiny of power elites um, as um, in the land of Lilliput. This is a wonderful late 19th century illustration of, uh, uh, of Gulliver's Travels, of Swift's Gulliver's Travels, and it's in the land of Lilliput. And you could see this almost as a simile for the kinds of attempted public scrutiny of power that is taking place thanks to network digital um, uh, uh, media and this phenomenon of communicative abundance. Now, I have tried in this lecture to highlight the positive elective affinities, we could say, between um, this emergent monetary democracy and the advent of communicative abundance, with its democratization of information, with its erosion of the public-private uh, uh, dualism, uh, with its muckraking, with the growth of unelected representatives and the growth of cross-border publics. Behind this uh, conjecture of mine about the relationship between um, a new historical form of democracy on the one side and an emergent new mode of communications is a much bigger thesis which I'd be prepared um, gladly to talk about uh, during the question and answer period. The bigger thesis is this, that every historical form of democracy is bound up with a particular historical mode of communication. Think of it like this. The world of classical assembly democracies, face-to-face -face encounters of men um, in public settings like the Paniques uh, in Athens, were embedded principally in the spoken word as the main um, uh, mode of communication, supplemented by messages carved in stone or written on papyrus and relayed by uh, foot runners and donkeys. The age of representative democracy, it's a neologism of the last quarter of the 18th century, the advent of an electoral form of uh, representative democracy was nurtured by the advent of print culture, by books, by pamphlets, by novels, by the daily newspaper, by letters, by printed messages conveyed even by telegraph. And perhaps, more than perhaps, it was no coincidence that representative democracy in territorial state form almost in its entirety was killed off or committed democide, as I have called it during the 1920s and 30s, during precisely the period when there's a big upheaval in the um, prevailing mode of communication, the coming of radio and broadcasting, film and early television, which as you know, um, whole uh, uh, regimes were uh, transformed by and dictators and totalitarians took advantage of. Fine, you may say, all very interesting. But why, in all of your talk of communicative abundance, did you not mention the decadent trends? Are there not wide and possibly widening gaps between the rosy ideals of free and public contestation of power, the unforced plurality of opinions and the inclusion and treatment of all citizens as equals, roughly the ideals of monetary democracy, and a harsher reality of media decadence? 
in which communication media are being used to promote intolerant opinions, to protect inequalities of wealth and income, to restrict the public scrutiny of power, and to promote the blind acceptance of the way things are heading. What about rumor firestorms? What about media bombs? Berlusconi is very good at media bombing. What about mean-spirited blogging, snark? What about digital Maoism of our time? Is it not true that Google and its secret algorithms are making us stupid? What about um, experiments with software like GeoTime that can map nearly every move of suspects uh, by bodies such as the US military and the London Metropolitan Police who have just adopted um, uh, uh, GeoTime software to track, to, to uh, put under surveillance uh, individuals suspected of this or that crime? What about the immobilizing um, uh, of organizations by spiteful hacking and spying and distributed denial of service attacks known in the trade as DDOs? Surely the internet is becoming the splinter net, as is now said in the United States, so that for growing numbers of people, the experience of using smartphones, tablets, e-readers, and other new gadgets to access the web is governed by platforms De designed by Microsoft, Apple, and other hyper-giant corporations to corner and to confine users within an ecosystem of predetermined gadgets, content, and advertising. Why was there no mention of media tycoons like Rupert Murdoch? I did mention uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi. Why the silence about experimental media cities like Abu Dhabi, the new Hollywood without the old California? What about the media sideshow? Lindsay Tanner, what about lobbyists and public relations agencies and the sly politician skilled at the art of telling lies and releasing bad news on busy days, what Tony Blair's tacticians called throwing out the bodies? <laughs> there was no recognition, surely, of the low-grade news, the flat-earth news, as Nick Davies calls it, and the no-earth news produced by what in England is called journalism. And not a single word about China, the new global power which is more than just the hub of the world's telecommunication industry, but according to Reporters Without Borders, in a recent report, the world's biggest prison for netizens and a giant political laboratory in which crafty methods of harnessing and manipulating digital communications might just succeed sometime in the 21st century of securing a post-democratic order. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's true. You would be right to raise such questions. All of them are legitimate. And I admit in this hour to being overwhelmed by them, cowed into silence by their complexity and power, and so I beg to be rescued and now turn to you for frank reactions, uh, positive suggestions, perhaps even on-the-spot answers to pretty urgent questions that without doubt bear vitally upon the future of democracy. Thank you very much.